All right, welcome back to our KO language series. Today we are going to finish working with a long listening passage from a past KO test so that we can continue to practice our listening skills. Let's do a very quick review to understand exactly what is required of us when we do the long listening passages on KO. So first of all, the lectures that we hear will be academic in nature. And there will be around 11 questions that we're going to need to answer based on what we listen to. The audio will only ever play one time. So it's really important to keep your ear moving along with what the speaker says. That means focus on what you do understand from the lecture. If you miss a word or don't understand a phrase, the best thing to do is just to let that go and continue on as the speaker is talking. Answer every single question, even if you have to guess. It's better to take a guess because you might get lucky and earn a point for that question. Now, there are a couple of routines, I guess, that we really need to get practiced before we take the kale test. What's going to happen as you begin this long listening section is that before you even hear the audio play, you're going to be given a little bit of time to read over the questions and the answer choices. So you'll have two and a half minutes to quickly skim read those 11 questions with their answers. Your job here is simply to be familiar with what the questions are asking. If you can identify the keywords from those questions and answer choices, you'll understand now what to listen for as the speaker is talking. Now, after that two and a half minutes of preview time has finished, the audio is going to start to play automatically. Your job then is to listen and answer as many questions as you can while the speaker is talking. After that audio has finished, you're going to be given an additional three minutes of time or so in order to finish any questions that maybe you missed initially or to double check your answers and simply make sure that they are all correct. Now remember, because you will be answering questions while listening to the, the lecture, you won't have time to take very detailed notes. I would not recommend taking notes at all while you're listening. You just won't have the time to do that. Instead, if you do finish answering all questions and you've got a little bit of time left over in the review section at the end, that would be a much better time to jot down a couple of important ideas as you think of them. Remember that later on in the next part of the kale test, when you do the writing section, you will be asked to use ideas presented in this lecture as you write your essay, but the computer is going to present for you a summarized outline of the important ideas discussed. So again, if you don't take your own notes here, that's okay. You'll work through the questions and have the computer's notes to help you later. Now, this is what your long listening section looks like. This happens to be a part four question. On the Kale test, you will be doing the long listening activities in parts three, four, and five. Because there are around 11 questions or so, you'll have different pages or different screens with the questions displayed. So you can see here that we are currently working on page one, which is why this number one has been shaded in, it's been selected. And the first question shows on the screen below. When you're ready to go on to the second question, of course, you would just click number two with your mouse and the screen or the page would advance. So you're going to work your way through all five pages there to preview those questions before the audio even begins to play. You'll notice in the top right hand corner there as well, there's a, a total time amount for the section. But right beside that, there's also a blue rectangular box with the word next written in it. I'm going to encourage you strongly not to use that button. What happens when you click next is you move to the next part of the kale test. You need to make sure that every single question is answered before you move on to the next section on kale. So once you do hit next and move on, there's no way to come back. There's no back button. So it would be impossible then to double check your work or to finish answering any questions. So again, I would use all of the time provided to you to first answer these questions and then to double check they're correct before that timer reaches zero. It's up to you, but use that next button very sparingly if you use it at all. 
Now remember you've got that two and a half minutes to read through the questions and answers quickly before the audio plays. So in the center of your screen here, you'll see the preparation time clock. It's going to count down those two and a half minutes, although it counts it down in seconds. So 150 seconds is actually the same as two and a half minutes. So this is where you quickly go over to the page numbers and you start skimming through those questions and answers to identify the key words, which are the important words in the passages. You don't have to write them down. I think as long as you just sort of tuck them into the back of your mind and your memory, you have a pretty good sense of what it is you're going to be listening for. So very quickly, again, two and a half minutes or so to get familiar with all of these keywords for all five pages, all 11 questions. So you would continue to do this, to skim read, until you've, you've accomplished that, until you finish them all. Now I'd like to practice two questions with us today so we can study together. We're going to answer question number six based on the speaker's lecture here that we'll listen to in a moment. So remember, we would have previewed this already before the audio plays. So this question says to fill in the blank with one word from the lecture. David Anthony's study is concerned with the domestication of blank. So again, the key word, the most important words that we're listening for as the speaker talks is to hear David Anthony's name. As soon as we hear his name, our ears should be very alert and we're trying to finish that phrase, domestication of blank. It will be one word, we are told, in this test instructions. Now remember, the entire lecture on the real test is going to play from beginning to end without stopping. But for practice purposes today, since we're only practicing two questions together, I'm going to play you just a little tiny part of this lecture. I'll play you one minute and 20 seconds or so. And somewhere within that chunk of the lecture, you will hear the answer to this question. So let's try it now and see if you can understand what David Anthony's idea is all about. Exist alternative theories for the domestication process. For instance, Richard Boulier, a professor of history at Columbia University, argues that animals were first used and domesticated for religious purposes. He argues that if humans wanted meat, they would kill the animals they found instead of putting the animals in an enclosure or pen and wait for them to breed. Boulier suggests that animals would be kept and used for recurring religious practices, such as summer solstice celebrations, or used as sacrifices in case of droughts or other natural disasters. The theory offers an explanation of why the animals would be kept unharmed for some time. Another interesting line of research is presented by David Anthony, an archeologist who explored the first domestication of horses. He relies on evidence from multiple sources, such as archeology, span linguistics, zoology, chemistry, and climatology amongst others. However, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. The domestication of horses is so closely tied to the development of the wheel that it deserves its own lecture. We'll leave that for next week. Okay, so that's as much as we're going to hear. We did hear the answer stated twice, as a matter of fact. So let's have a quick look at the part of the transcript that gives us that answer. Now, remember on the real kale test, there is never going to be a transcript. You're simply going to listen and answer the questions. But because we are studying together, it's helpful, I think, if we can all see the words that we just heard the speaker talk about. So you'll notice there the transcript, I've highlighted the name David Anthony, just so we can see it. Again, on the KL test, you can't highlight the screen, but we'll do that together today as we practice. So as soon as David Anthony's name is mentioned, your ears are very, very alert. And shortly after that, you can see that the speaker talks about the domestication of horses. So there's the key that matches the statement from uh, the question on the right. We see domestication of, that's what we're listening for. And the word that follows, horses, is the answer itself. So you would simply click your cursor into the box on the answer side and use the keyboard at the test to type in the word horses. Please make sure that you spell this word correctly. I know this word is easy to spell, but in other tests you might have more complex vocabulary that you're filling in. 
the reason for that is that the computer itself is what's going to mark all of your answers here for the listening. So if you misspell the words that you're putting into the box, the computer probably won't recognize what it is you're trying to say, and you won't get the point for the question. So please do make sure that you are copying exactly the word that you're taking um, from the audio itself. I know you won't see the transcript when you're typing this in, but hopefully you know how to spell the words that you're, um, that you're entering there. That's just a little tip. All right, let's answer one more question. We're going to do question eight because it's remarkably more challenging than the first one we did today. So now that we're all warmed up, let's see if we can tackle this one. So again, as we previewed the, the uh, questions and answers before we even listened to the lecture, we would have understood that we were listening for a statement that the instructor probably agrees with. Now, right away in that question itself, I'm hoping that you're recognizing the word probably as an inference question. So what that means then is that the speaker herself does not ever give us the answer directly as she's talking. Instead, what we have to do is listen to what she has to say and decide which one of these four statements is the one that she'd most likely agree with. All right, we are making an assumption or drawing a logical conclusion using all of the ideas that she's giving us in the lecture itself. So again, in your preview time, what I'm hoping you do is you recognize that all four answer choices here talk about theories and beliefs. Do you see that as you scan the, the four choices? Every single answer choice there mentions the word theory or belief. So very quickly, if you could pull out, say, one word in each answer choice that makes it slightly different from the next, I think that's going to help you really pinpoint the, uh, the speaker's idea. So answer A there talks about how theories should be supported. B talks about how they should be tested. Answer C suggests that theories might have been falsified. So I guess that means that someone has taken old evidence and gone back and tried to uh, falsify or make untrue the claims that were made. That's what that word means. And answer D here talks about how people need to be very cautious or careful when they are listening to common beliefs that have been suggested. So you can see how each of these four ideas, even though they all discuss theories and beliefs, are slightly different. So again, we're going to listen to the lecture to try to determine what we think the speaker would most likely agree with. Now, again, the, the whole lecture, remember, would be about five minutes long and you would listen from beginning to end. So you could be pulling out information anywhere throughout this lecture that will help you answer this question. I'm going to play another short clip of about one minute and 20 seconds for you. And I think within this clip, you're going to have all the evidence you need to select the best answer. All right, let's listen carefully and see if we can come up with the right answer. Theories explaining domestication existed throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Some theories are usually not based on evidence or any empirical data. It was once believed that there was some genius out there who decided to domesticate the first animal. For some time, scientists believed that scarce resources would force animals and humans to live closer together, which would in turn foster domestication. For instance, the oasis theory, developed by Gordon Child in 1950, states that as the climate became drier in Central Asia, people would concentrate around oasis areas. Scarcity of wild resources prompted cultivation of plants, which in turn attracted animals. The problem with the oasis theory is that domestication did not initially occur in oases, as we now know. Joel Cohen proposed an alternative theory, suggesting that population growth and lack of food prompted people to cultivate plants and domesticate animals. However, the theory does not fully hold because firstly, it assumes that domestication was intentional. And secondly, domestication is very gradual, meaning it does not provide great benefits in the first generations. Okay, so that's as much as we're going to listen to for now. And I'm hoping you're starting to get some ideas here about which one of these statements is correct. At the very least, hopefully you've been able to eliminate one or two answers that don't seem to be correct. So in this case, having a, a transcript to look at, I think is going to be most helpful for sure. 
So remember that all four answer choices discuss theories in some capacity. So as soon as the speaker mentioned the word theories in her lecture, that's once again where we're very alert and we assume that we're going to be getting enough information that follows in order to point us in the right direction to answer the right question. So about a third of the way down this transcript area, that's where the speaker introduces the first theory to us, and it's called the OASIS theory. So as we look at this transcript and remember what we heard as the speaker was talking about, she's introducing the man's name, Gordon Child, who put forth this theory in 1950. And the whole crux of this theory is that it was so dry in Central Asia that Gordon Child thought that people then met around oasis areas. Now, an oasis is an area that has a water source that's usually in a very dry climate, like a desert. So again, uh, people would congregate around these oases. And then sh she's summarizing his theory further to tell us that it's the scarcity of wild resources that prompted the cultivation of plants. So in other words, because the climate was so dry, there weren't a lot of trees and shrubs and things that were growing naturally there. So the people who were meeting around these water sources began to plant their own trees and so on. And once they planted these trees and shrubs, that's what attracted the animals to that area. So this is how Gordon Child has proposed the oasis theory has domesticated animals. Now, so far, the speaker has simply summarized Gordon Child's theory to us. She hasn't presented any personal ideas around what she thinks about the theory. That comes next. So she does mention that there seems to be a problem with this theory. She says that domestication did not initially occur in oases. In other words, that's not where domestication of animals started. And here's the really important phrase that she said. She says, as we now know. So what that indicates is, although parts of this theory might ring true, sure, people might have met around oases and, and eventually animals and so on came there. She's saying, we now know that domestication did not start there. Okay, so keep that in mind. And again, consider those four answer choices on the right-hand side. This should be pushing you towards one of the answers. Okay, now that's just one example of the theory. The speaker goes on to give us one more alternative theory. And this one is proposed by Joel Cohen. The idea here, the speaker says, according to Cohen, is that population growth and the lack of food is what motivated people to cultivate plants and domesticate the animals. So a slightly different approach. Cohen is suggesting it's because there were so many people and not enough food, and that's what made them uh, plant these trees and shrubs and domesticate animals later. So once again, the speaker is simply summarizing Joel Cohen's theory to us. She hasn't commented either way on anything that would really tell us which answer choice is correct. That comes next. So the speaker says, however, the theory does not fully hold. And again, here in green is what's really important. When she says it doesn't fully hold, what she's acknowledging is there might be aspects of Joel Cohen's theory that are accurate. But again, we now know in today's modern climate that there are ideas that just aren't true. And she goes on to explain. She says, first of all, you know, this theory of Joel Cohen makes an assumption that domestication was intentional. And she's implying that that might not be the case. And secondly, she's also arguing that domestication is gradual. So once again, there's uh, some ideas that might be true in both of these theories, but the speaker herself points out that we now have other information, you know, 70 years later, that does point out some faulty ideas as well. So let's go back now to these four answer choices and see which one you came up with as the correct choice. So looking at answers A and B that talk about how these theories should be both supported or tested. The speaker did not give any indication at all that we have to go back and test these theories or that we need more support to prove these theories and so on. So neither of these answers have been implied by the speaker. They're not the best choice. So we're going to eliminate them for, from consideration and move on to answers C and D. Now, answer C talks about falsifying theories with old evidence. 
And again, there is nothing that we heard the speaker say to indicate to us that somebody went back and purposely tried to prove untrue some of these ideas presented using evidence brought forward. So I would eliminate as well answer C. It's not quite accurate. That's not what the speaker here is implying. We're left with only one answer choice, answer D. So presumably that would be the right answer, but let's just consider the accuracy of the idea. Answer D here says that historians should be cautious about using common beliefs. And again, if you look back at our transcript, particularly at those two phrases that have been highlighted in green, that's evidence to us that the speaker is saying, sure, some of these past theories might have elements of truth to them, but there are also elements that we now know aren't true at all, just based on other research and so on that has happened as years have gone by. So she's just trying to warn us all that we have to be very careful when learning about all of these initial theories, because once again, the ideas presented then might just be a little bit different from what we now know to be true. So with that in mind then, answer D is the, the most logical choice. It seems to be what the speaker is implying as she discusses these theories. So we would select answer D on the test, and then of course you would continue moving through questions nine, 10, and 11. So let's review what we did today with our listening strategies. Remember, you always have roughly two and a half minutes to go through the questions and answers on the test, just to get familiar with all of the keywords so you know what you're listening for when that lecture begins. When the speaker is talking, listen very carefully for those keywords that you've identified, and listen also for any synonyms or paraphrased ideas. The speaker's words might not match word for word what's listed in the question and answer, but the ideas themselves might be the same. So you'll have to be very careful about that as well. Answer as many questions as you can while the audio is playing. Remember the audio will play for about five minutes or so. Most of the answers will be presented in the same order that the speaker's talking about, give or take. If you have an inference question, you know, you might take information from different parts of the text. So that one might be hard to put into a particular order, but all of these other specific detail type questions, they'll generally follow the order that the speaker is talking. So that should help you keep on track a little bit as you work through those questions. Again, because you're so busy answering questions while you're listening, you won't have time to take detailed notes. All right, don't distract yourself with note taking. Your priority is to answer as many questions as you can. You will have some time at the very end, about three minutes or so once the audio has finished, to go back and answer any questions that maybe you skipped. You know, if you didn't catch the answer the first time, now it's your chance to get it done. You can also use this time to double check that your questions and answers make sense. So read them back through to yourself. If you need to make any changes, you can certainly do that, but just make sure your test is exactly the way you want it before that timer reaches zero. Because once the clock hits zero, the test is going to move on to the next section and your answers will be submitted. All right, so we've now finished working through this passage to really practice our long listening skills for the Kale test. Join me next week as we continue to improve our language skills. See you then.